ओके Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Nilanjan Sarkar and I am Deputy Director of the LSE South Asia Centre uh, here at the London School of Economics. I'm very happy to welcome all of you to this event, this afternoon's event, which is the next in our Fact and Fiction series, which for those of you who've been following our events, uh, these are discussions that are based on um, focused on one book and we get this galaxy of people, experts to speak on it, and then we have a wonderful discussion. It's also most likely the last event of this term, after which we will um, break for, for Christmas and New Year, and then we will uh, come back with an, a new uh, term, term of events. The book that is going to be discussed this afternoon is Monica Geneja's Can Art History Be Made Global? Meditations from the Periphery, which was published in 2023. I'm going to hold it up for all of you to see. There it is. You also know I have a copy of it. And I'm not going to say too much about the book uh, because uh, we're just going to invite Monica to speak. And we uh, and she's going to give a summary of the main arguments. Also, uh, we are going to stick to time because we have so much happening today. But and in the in the event with so many wonderful speakers, uh, but before I get on to introducing the speakers, I want to say a very warm welcome to all of you who are uh, watching this event online. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interest. Uh, so many of you have written to us. So many of you are actually viewing this from across the globe. And uh, we are very grateful um, that that you, you, you've made time to be in, in this event uh, this afternoon. The event is actually happening via Zoom, even though you are watching it on YouTube. And as you will see that the chat function is enabled and you can ask your questions over there via the chat function. When you ask your questions, you can pose it to a particular speaker. You can also pose it to the entire panel. And we will then take those questions at irregular intervals once the panelists have, have finished speaking and making their initial remarks. If you are the kinds who tweet and would like to tweet, then please do tweet and tag our center at S Asia LSC. Uh, the Twitter handle appears in the details on your screen against my name, and you'll be able to tag us over there. Also, finally, if this event was happening on site at LSC, then me members of the audience at the LSC uh, have the right to ask questions to at an event without revealing their identity. In keeping with that rule in principle, when I ask questions on your behalf, I will not be revealing your names, even though, of course, I can see your names on, on the YouTube channel, but at least we remain close to the spirit of, of, of the rule as far as possible. It is now my very pleasant duty to introduce all the speakers. We've had a brief chat just before we came live on air to decide the order of speakers and the order in which I introduce you, uh, the speakers, are, is the order in which they will speak. We will first invite the author, Monica Geneja, to make a presentation of her book, which will be about 10 to 12 minutes, after which every individual speaker will make their initial remarks, then Monica will respond to those remarks, and then uh, the discussion will begin. Monica Geneja is Professor of Global Art History at the Heidelberg Center for Transcultural Studies at Heidelberg University and author of Can Art History Be Made Global? Meditations from the Periphery, which was published earlier this year and is the book which is being discussed at this afternoon's event. Annie Coombs is Professor of Material and Visual Culture at Birkbeck University of London and founding director of its Pels Gallery. Most recently, Annie has co-edited with Ruth Phillips, Museum Transformations, Decolonization, and Democratization. Deborah Hutton is Professor of Art History at the College of New Jersey with a specialism in South Asian art, global art history, and visual culture. She is most recently co-author with Dianin Li of The History of Asian Art, A Global View, Prehistory to the Present. Dr. Matthew Falgraf is a cultural historian of science focusing on modern Central Europe and currently NOMIS Fellow at the University of Basel. He is co-editor with Frank Feierenbach of Ecologies of Expression, which was published in 2022. I should tell you that book is actually in German, but I didn't try saying the German name. I simply used the English one. Parul Davi Mukherjee is the discussant this afternoon. 
Barul is professor in the School of Arts and Aesthetics at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi and is editor, most recently, of Ibrahim al Qazi, Directing Art, The Making of a Modern Indian Art World. I should also say, in fairness, that most of our speakers today have several other publications. I have only read out one of them, the ones that I picked myself. Everyone, welcome. We are delighted to have you. And we're looking forward to the discussion. Uh, Monica, I'm going to invite you now to make your presentation. Monica has a PowerPoint for those of you who are watching online. And Monica will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. Monica, please speak now. Yeah, thank you, Nilanjan. Let me share my screen. Okay. So, yeah, here we are. Uh, the question this book addresses concerns a critical approach to art history that would enable the discipline to break out of different shades of parochialism, be it Eurocentrism, methodological nationalism, or <clears throat> insulated area studies, and yet at the same time not lose its situatedness in specific contexts. I have chosen to flesh out such a critical globality through the concept of transculturation, which undermines the stable nexus between culture and the territorial container of the nation state by drawing our attention to the processuality of cultural formations. This offers a new ontology of culture, which views it not as given, but as constituted through processes of interaction. That is, culture is not only fundamentally made through processes of transculturation in the first place, but continuously remade through all subsequent phases of its existence. Processual and continually morphing, such an ontology of culture is also concrete in that it is made from the ground up precisely through its interaction between units that are constituted through these very processes. By disrupting the nexus between nation and culture, a transcultural perspective actually allows you to unpack the nation state by bringing multilingualism, plural ethnicities, migration, all as constitutive for those identities that inhabit the so-called imagined community. This in turn means a study of culture not contained within the boundaries of the modern nation. Transculturation takes the global beyond additive extension or inclusion and instead points to the need to question the epistemic foundations of disciplines that have been created within the context of nation building. That opens up disciplines for a critical questioning of the taxonomies and values that have been built into each one since its inception and have been taken as universal. In the case of art history, these concern the hierarchies of genres or concepts such as style that is often artificially maintained by attending to a single geographical location as self-contained and works as a stabilizing device to suppress the endless mobility and metamorphoses of objects and forms. Such a critique further allows us to question values transported by so much of art history, such as originality, authenticity, and so on. It necessitates bringing back excluded materials, texts, and questions center stage. A theory of transculturation not only shakes up a system of organizing the world into centers and peripheries, but allows you to reconceive notions such as the peripheral or belatedness and turn them into sources of agency. Positioning oneself on the periphery cannot, however, be carried out by simply reversing an established hierarchy while leaving its teleology intact. Writing from the periphery in the approach followed in this book is premised on viewing both centers and peripheries through a transcultural lens to argue that each site is a hotbed of transculturation and cannot be studied in its exclusive pockets. With that perspective then, the investigations in this book take as their starting point a region long regarded as periphery of Euro-America, that is South Asia, to then open it to a transcultural analysis that would overcome the limitations of both the national framework as well as the provincialism of a single sealed area. The studies undertaken here address the challenge of finding explanatory paradigms for dealing with processes which, following mobility and encounter, are formed through a tension between cultural difference and historical connectivity. Such processes might appear paradoxical in that they combine accommodation, partial absorption, refusal or engagement, 
at different levels with cultural difference without, however, producing synchronicity. Each of the chapters of this book is informed by the concern to link the region to the mainstream discipline so as to reflect on the latter's underlying assumptions and point the way to a non-hierarchical, critical and capacious art history that can serve as a potential tool for unraveling connections, differences and frictions amongst regions across the globe. The book, oh, I can't move this. The book begins by <clears throat> investigating the genealogies of art history of the 19th century when it sought to in integrate the world into the purview of a discipline that was long fixated on Greco-Roman antiquity. It becomes important to query the legacies of this historiographic current for the present global turn within the discipline. The first chapter examines the scholarship that sought to produce authoritative knowledge about nations, cultures, and the world. Investigating this particular trajectory of the discipline is important, not least because it has been recently hailed as prefiguring present attempts to make the discipline global. The chapter focuses primarily, though not exclusively, on German language texts that came under the label of Weltkunstgeschichte, or world art history, and analyzes the premises and argumentative structures that characterize the effects of art history to revitalize itself by bringing the world into its purview. I asked why the cosmopolitan potential ascribed to this current art historiography remained unrealized during a moment of intense global exchange and challenges, not dissimilar to those of the present. What are the methodological implications of these initiatives for similar positions today? This particular genealogy of world making in art history directs our attention to those epistemic foundations that continue to shape our scholarly practice between the North Atlantic West, as well as those regions of the world where the modern discipline has journeyed and acquired roots, even as it responds to local, local contingencies. The exercise in unpacking the foundations of an art history that strove to be inclusive is an urgent one in contemporary times as the discipline endeavors once more to become global. Chapter two, making and seeing images, tracking the roots of vision in early modern Eurasia, takes at its starting point theoretical stances in the field of world art studies that have tended to alternate between two poles, between the view which considers seeing or vision as constituting a human universal, a common anthropological denominator that holds humans together across time and space, and the extreme relativist position which advocates the use of each culture's traditional traditions, core concepts of visuality in the image whose Im incommensurability and fixity are assumed. As distinct from these positions, I propose that vision itself needs to be a subject of historical investigation. The case study discussed in this chapter focuses on image making and circulation in early modern court cultures in South Asia framed in a Eurasian context. It examines the ways in which translating the scene onto a two-dimensional surface of the image was a process shaped by the dynamic between cultural mobility across sites in Europe and Asia, and new forms of reflection induced by itinerant images and objects, producing thereby different grades of commensurability and incommensurability. An important dimension, the transculturation of image worlds was the self-conscious use of art historical referencing in the practice of image making, citation, repetition, cop copying and pastiche as modes of cultural communication and articulations of worldly awareness. Intrinsic to a trans-regional and trans-historical circulation of objects and attitudes towards the image, the chapter argues, are cosmologies and questions of hermeneutics that account for the degree of their assimilability to translation, as well as its refusal. This study, in addition, allows us to disaggregate a singular conception of vision into historically variable ways of seeing in which the materiality of image making equally informs vision to make it a synesthetic experience. Chapter three, traversing scales, transcultural modernism with and beyond the nation, 
engages with the conceptual category of modernism for long viewed as a quintessentially European phenomenon, which was then said to have spread to the rest of the world. My account participates in the critical scrutiny that such a position has undergone in the recent years in the wake of prolific research from a range of regional positions and the translation of these findings through the medium of the art exhibition. Studies of modernism from the peripheries have questioned its monolithic nature and argued for an expanded definition that would include the artistic experiments of modernist artists in Asia, Africa, Eastern Europe, and Latin America. The challenge, however, remains that of avoiding the pitfalls of recounting exclusively local histories or the trap of treating regional or national cultures as closed units. This chapter seeks to bring regions and nations onto a more dynamic, non-hierarchical, and importantly, non-homogenizing relationship with each other, arguing that this cannot be adequately handled without simultaneously delving into localities and negotiating multiple scales, the local, regional, national, and global. The story of modernism recounted here takes South Asia as its focal point to argue against both a diffusionist view as well as one which proposes multiple or alternative or regional modernisms. Rather, it looks at connected processes of translation and reconfiguration at encounters of persons and narratives, as well as at endeavors inspired by idealist internationalism that in the end faltered in the face of cultural difference. Differences that unfolded in local or regional settings frequently cut across the colonizer colony divide to reach out to both shared the global horizons as well as individual micro histories. The final section of this chapter explores the migratory fortunes of the category of the primitive designated the alter ego of artistic modernism. It does so by plotting aspects of its conceptual history from different locations across Europe and Asia onto a single matrix to then uncover the ambivalent nature of its appropriation by modernist artists on the Indian subcontinent working in the interstices of anti-colonial nationalism and worldly cosmopolitanism. Chapter four, Beyond Backwater Arcadias, continues the periphery in approach by <clears throat> drawing attention to those sites of cultural action uh, and crucial to contemporary art that loosen the rigid linearity of narratives, segregating contemporaneity from the modern. Such vibrant peripheries the chapter shows produce both novel art as well as a critical discourse and therefore demand a fresh optic to theorize the context within which artistic projects as well as conceptual insights are born. They serve as a locus of the transculturation of the avant-garde as it becomes global. The quest for artistic selfhood in post-colonial contexts, and here too the focus is on South Asia, has involved a staggering transformation of codes and media initiatives in which both in which globalized locality constitutes a space to rethink tradition beyond the predicament of being always somebody's others. This is a quote from Rustam Barucha. <clears throat> Drawing on the work of a handful of artists, the chapter fleshes out how a more politicized engagement with the dilemmas of the contemporary, induced by the crisis of liberal democracies, mass migration, and the spectacular regimes of global capitalism, has made contemporary art practice in a post-colonial nation state a domain to explore forms of identity beyond the nation. The international spirit of global exchange has on the one hand encouraged transcultural affiliations and forms of co-production as ways to resist complicity with global capital. At the same time, such affiliations and the circulation of ideas remain to a lesser or greater degree dependent on big capital that sustains enterprises such as biennials and a globalized network of exhibitions, galleries, and art publishing. Chapter five, when art embraces the planet, the contemporary global ex exhibition form and the challenge of connected histories revisits the famous, also controversial Paris exhibition of 1989, Magicien de la Terre, conceptualized as the first planetary show of contemporary art, which at the same time sought to challenge the conventions of exhibition making within the narrow confines of the art world and its modern taxonomic frames. The analysis asks whether incorporating art from the West 
from beyond the West within contemporary exhibition circuits can engender a discursive space to remap cultural geographies and theorize the dystopian stroke disjunctive condition of contemporaneity? Or does it merely answer global capitalism's need for new commodities? Do new boundaries come into, the way, come into being in the wake of the connectivity that dissolves older ones? My investigation moves from the center back to the periphery. It follows the bold topography of magicien across continents to those sites where the works that had traveled to Paris were produced and anchored and to examine their post-magicien lives. My urge is to read objects, their producers and curators co while restoring to different sites their particular historicity. The example of South Asia and its archives has been used to draw out the complex histories of cultures that live in a permanent and fluctuating relationality with one another. These dynamics get lost when we exclusively attend to dismantling the centrality of the so-called West, even if to castigate its cultural biases. These multiscalar story, stories sensitize us to new fault lines within the domain of the contemporary and to the complexity of inclusion as a curatorial strategy. Tracing a connected history of the first whole earth show in turn draws our attention to the emergence of another transcultural category, that of the global indigenous that has come to serve as an umbrella term for indigenous art practices from across the divide of North and South of settler colonies and post-colonial nations. And finally, the postscript looks ahead to a fresh transition already underway from the global to the planetary. Anthropogenic climate change, also described as a crisis of culture, has propelled the humanities towards the sciences now brought under the rubric of planetary humanities. The implications of this radical turn asks us to recalibrate our understanding of culture by breaking out of enlightenment ontologies that separate nature from culture. Could the transcultural in turn be re-envisioned re -envisioned to incorporate an all-embracing matrix of relationships wherein forms arise in a conjoint activity between human and non-human actors? And what would this imply for doing art history in a planetary, non-anthropocentric mode? These are some preliminary reflections that point in the direction of a new project to think the future of art history under the aegis of a new planetary consciousness. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, that, ha having read the book, uh, um, I could say that 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 was just so very useful for all all members of the audience as well as for all of us. Um, it it was such a wonderful summary and. Uh, for, for members of the audience, you know, we were just before we came live on air, we were having a chat uh, on on uh, amongst ourselves, and I think it was Matthew who said that it was theoretically so so uh, dense. And I was going to say to Matthew at that time that you know I had a chat with uh, Monica a few days ago, and I said to her, "Your book is not for the faint-hearted, whoever it is for." Uh, but there you go. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, on first. Uh, speaker for, for comment. I'm going to introduce our speakers again because I'm watching the live stream in front of me as well and I can see that some more people have joined since I did the introductions initially. Our first uh, comments are going to come from Annie Coombs who is Professor of Material and Visual Culture at Birkbeck University of London and founding director of its Pels Gallery. Most recently, Annie has co-edited with Ruth Phillips, Museum Transformations, Decolonization and Democratization, which was published in 2020. Annie, please speak now. Annie, you need to unmute yourself. The most basic rule, right? Hello, everyone, um, in whatever time zone you're joining us from. And thank you to uh, Dr. Nanjan Sarkar and the South Asia Center at LSE for inviting me to be part of this panel and to celebrate Monica Janeja's latest book, Can Art History Be Made Global? Meditations from the Periphery. And thank you, Monica, for writing it. It's the other thing I just want to say straight away. 
Um, I want to begin really by saying something about how Monica and I first met, since it provides an insight, I think, into the strengths of her book, which is, of course, part of a much longer uh, ongoing research and teaching agenda. In uh, 2018, Professor Janeja and her colleague at Duke University, Professor Sumati Ramaswamy, had invited me to participate in their delightfully named uh, Salon for Slow Reading and Deep Looking on the theme of monuments in Heidelberg, which took as its initial focus readings from Kashri Jain's then forthcoming book, Gods in the Time of Democracy, uh, which was subsequently published in 2021, and my own body of research on monuments and memorialization. In other respects, I think the Salon evoked many of the themes of the book we're here to discuss on this panel. Slow reading and deep looking, well, you know, how could one say no to a workshop that prioritized processes which have become so underrated and degraded of late through otherwise enabling technologies that nonetheless so often, you know, end up creating lazy shortcuts, which undermine the structure of books and render opaque the methodologies that help to produce our core arguments as authors. Slow reading and deep looking also, I think, neatly summarizes the generative methodology behind can art history be made global. The Salon had given me a newfound awareness of the complexities of Narendra Modi's project of Hindu nationalism, the overpowering impact of his related program of public monumental sculpture in India, and the constraints and risks actually taken by some contemporary artists also, uh, by the way, participating in the Salon, whose work engaged critically with this agenda. Upon returning home, my Mauritian British neighbors of 23 years were in the throes of Shraddha with the sounds of daily prayers coming from the marquee erected to honor Rita's mum's life in the small North London garden adjoining ours. And together with my other next door neighbors whose parents came to Britain from the Caribbean on the Empire Windrush, we paid our respects and I, celebrated, you know, the fact that in my little corner of London, these three incommensurate worlds can coexist. But just a few years before, while I was mourning the outcome of the Brexit vote and Britain's expulsion from Europe, our same neighbours were throwing a party to celebrate the decision. I'm struck by precisely the conundrum so forensically explored by Monica's book in relation to art worlds and art histories, but which in my anecdote is extended to encompass the lived experience of a North London street. These are the results you know, of the complex and contradictory allegiances thrown up by intersecting colonial histories. They are the very, they're at the very heart, I think, of Janeja's scholarship. When my colleague Aftar Bra and I published our collection, Hybridity and Its Discontents, Politics, Science, Culture, 23 years ago now, in 2000, our aim was to unpack what we felt was a rather overused and slippery concept, to unpick it precisely through an analysis of the ways in which it was deployed and its meanings interconnected across continents, temporalities and fields. In other words, to analyze the contingencies of the term as a process, which when understood relationally, constructed and produced particular knowledges. And so in some ways then the impetus for our collection was similar to Janeja's uh, chipping away at the comforting myths, I think in her book of modernity, identity and plurality, the having one's cake and eating it of a simple idea of globalization and its effects in the world. What Monica Janeja has accomplished in this magisterial study is to home in on how such issues and concepts have impinged on and constructed their objects in the discipline of art history. The book asks us to consider the term transcultural as a more accurate replacement for other concepts designed to explain 
the cross-cultural modalities of modernisms and the structuring dimensions of global capital. Entanglements, hybridity, and the vague supplementarity of terms such as alternative, for example, are dispatched by Janeja. Her arguments in the book are always engaging and rigorously mapped, though I wonder if it's not in the ways in which these terms are deployed that renders them either obfuscatory or clarifying and historically precise. For me, one of the book's major achievements actually lies in the way in which each of the chapters introduces a critical synthesis of the debates around key defining categories that both hamper and help to constitute a global history of art. So just as Monica talked us through the chapters of the book, scale, the primitive, the contemporary, and latterly, the indigenous. Each key term is then elaborated and complicated by a historicized series of case studies on South Asian art, spanning a vast period from the 17th century, as we've seen, actually, to the 21st. New bodies of knowledge are created in the book by the careful attention to temporal and contextual detail in the sections on South Asian art, precisely the result actually of deep looking and slow reading that underpins the theoretical models guiding Janeja's inquiry into the applicability of thinking arts histories as not only globally interconnected, but also crucially coeval. At this moment of COP28, I, I wonder, you know, if the greater awareness of different knowledge systems spurred on by climate change and the urgent need to seek real and sustainable alternatives to, for example, fossil fuels, might also have an effect on the readiness to engage multiple um, visual regimes and systems of representation, particularly in the arena of architecture. Though architecture is not a, really a field at all of production that the book um, deals with, I think. I was recently at the uh, Architectural Biennale in Venice this year, uh, Africa and diaspora focused, and I was impressed by how a number of exhibitors outside of the national pavilions were showcasing building projects which mobilize materials and building systems premised on local and indigenous practices. And it seemed to me that in the best of these experiments, the architects, for example, in this case, the Senegalese uh, engineer, Dudu Deme from Elementaire, or um, the Kenyan practice Cave Bureau, whether they were not engaging in a they 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 weren't engaging in a reification of the local or the indigenous, but rather were involved in deep research into which language, histories, materials, and methods might be viable and transferable as a solution to the dilemmas posed by climate change and the constraints meted out by economic precarity. And despite being a manifestation of the much maligned cycle of global exhibitions, in many ways rightly slated in Monica's book, the Architectural Biennale and other large group exhibitions might nevertheless demonstrate a value in being seen comparatively together as a group, pushing against the limitations of, in this case, uh, climate change. In the heartland of the US art establishment, that icon of modernism, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, it now has, well, it's had actually an ongoing post called Notes on Art in a Global Context, which describes itself, and this is taken from its website, MoMA's as MoMA's online resource, designed, devoted to art and the history of modernism in a global context, and designed to share research on as it says, art histories outside North America and Western Europe. One can only hope that can art history be made global will be on their radar sooner rather than later, if it isn't already. <laughs> so thank you, Monica. Thank you very much. And thank you. To thank you. Thank you. That, that was wonderful. Thank you, Annie. Um,
I'm now going to invite our next uh, speaker for comments. Deborah Hutton is Professor of Art History at the, New the College of New Jersey with a specialism in South Asian art, global art history, and visual culture. Deborah is most recently co-author with Denon Lee of The History of Asian Art, A Global View, Prehistory to the Present, which was published earlier this year. Deborah, please speak now. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to begin by also thanking you all for um, making me part of this panel. And Monica, thank you for writing this incredible book. Um, <clears throat> as I said, I when we were talking before the panel began, um, I've been sp I've spent the last seven years thinking about global art history, but from a very sort of introductory perspective, writing textbooks and teaching at the undergraduate level in the United States. And um, <clears throat> so reading this book was, um, I had this uncanny experience of feeling as if Monica and I, who have never met actually in person, had been having a conversation. There were so many things that she was uh, thinking about that I had also been thinking about and providing answers to some things I had been struggling with. So um, that felt really productive and wonderful from this book. And so with that in mind, I wanted to point out what I saw as four important interventions that this book provides for those of us who are working on the project of making art history global. And I will say that it often feels a bit like moving in quicksand, that there's something about the discipline of art history that is so powerful, kudos to those who made the discipline over the years, that no matter what we do to try to make it more global or make it more inclusive, the center seems to absorb it somehow. Um, and, and that might be a question that I'll put out from the beginning that I would love for us to discuss is how do we move forward? How do we move from individual books, individuals um, thinking through in incredibly smart ways to the larger scale overhaul of the discipline in the ways that I think many of us feel like it's, it urgently needs to happen. Um, so, okay, the first intervention is this uh, transcultural theory, the theory of transculturalization um, that it puts forward. And I and um, that's already been discussed and I think it's a wonderful term, and I, but I want to point out why I think it's such an important intervention. Um, when I've been working on global art history, I also have come to realize that art history's ties to the nation state are a problem. Um, it's it's so close, the relationship between art history and the nation state in ways that the discipline has benefited from and that we as art historians have benefited from. Certainly, if I look at my own career, how much of it was funded by the American Institute of Indian Studies, right, that I owe a debt to the link between art history and nation states. But in a time of rising ethno-nationalism, <clears throat> militarism, the violence done by borders, by nations. Um, is that a relationship that we can continue to have so uncritically and how do we free our history from this relation to the nation state, both in terms of thinking about things like style, but just on an ethical level as well. And that has led me to, uh, like Monica discusses in one of the chapters of the book, um, look towards feminism for theories and answers. And I've been drawn to transnational feminism for the ways in which it balances um, solidarity with difference, right? And, and that has given me many theoretical lenses through which to look at art history. The problem with transnational feminism is that it works very well for the present because it's an activist thing, but going backwards in time, you end up sort of projecting the nation state backwards in time in a way that reifies it rather than takes it apart. And so I found transcultural theory to be that which I was lacking, that that's very helpful in breaking free from the nation state and being able to still talk about art history over the long durée. So that's the first. Um, the second intervention um, is very much the fact that you're talking about global, not just in this contemporary moment, but back in time. I, of course, love the chapter on um, early modern uh, as an early modernist, um, but I, but also, in fact, also in terms of when you talk about, when the book talks about modernity and even contemporary art, it does throw through a lens of um, historical specificity. 
right? Not just looking at the specific networks that through which connections were made that I think is very important that we, we keep this um, focus on history and understanding change over time and the concrete specific networks through which art and exchange has happened. Um, and, and that actually brings me to my first question that I have, um, which uh, Monica is obviously you focus on the early modern, modern and contemporary. Um, and certainly I'm somewhat glad you didn't do all the way back in time because the, then the book would have been even taken me even longer to read. Um, but do you think there is something about from the early modern onwards that makes this theory of transculturation uh, more appropriate? Or do you think it is something that we can project further back in time? Um, all right, so the third one is your discussion of modernity um, and uh, the fact that um, the way the book discusses modernist art and art history as being two faces of the same coin. And I think that that is so important that, you know, I, I wonder more and more if we can really truly teach modern art in isolation without also teaching the history of art history, the history of museums, the history of world exhibitions, and even the history of, of um, the technologies of image reproduction in publications. Um, so I think that that linkage is, is really important to not let modern art be exceptional, to have to put it into that historical context. Um, and then the fourth in intervention is the discussion of art and the Anthropocene, and really this, this moment that we are in of climate change and thinking about how do we break free from that enlightenment ontology, separating humans from nature um, as being the work that art history needs to do moving forward. Um, as I mentioned to you beforehand that the final chapter in the textbook, uh, Asian Art, a Global View that I just um, co-authored, our final chapter is a, in fact on Asian art and a planetary perspective, because we also feel quite strongly that this is the mode forward. And to that end, just as Annie um, mentioned um, with the architecture, um, I was wondering if there are certain mediums that are better set, better um, suited to maybe forge a path forward for us as art historians to talk about that. So something like architecture, it, it compared to contemporary art in gallery settings, is there something, or I was thinking about textiles is, and, and the methods that text, that art historians of textiles use that could be a way into that. Um, Sylvia Hoteling has a wonderful new book on textiles during the Mughal empire. And she talks there about textiles as being the ultimate global commodity that moves all over the world, but always having this connection to the local because it was the specific soil that grew the plant that made the dye that was fixed in that water that could never be reproduced any place else except that spot on the Cormondal coast, but then it ends up all over the world. And I was also thinking about um, some interesting works I've read about actually the history of sheep and, and the history of sheep going back to prehistory in West Asia and the ways in which humans and sheep and wheat production are all intertwined. And that sheep that, you know, sheep have now, they have to be sheared. They can't, they need humans to get rid of their wool that which then gets used for textiles. But the sheep ate the ground, which allowed the wheat to grow and helped humans find water. And there's this long-term reciprocal relationship there that I wonder if could could be a way in. So that would, that's my, um, I have many other questions for you. I will throw out one more, if you don't mind, um, that I would love to hear what everyone on this panel thinks about. And that is in the book, you, you make it clear the ways in which we can easily go wrong in this conversation, that terms can be misused, that exhibitions, <laughs> right? Uh, like the magicians uh, can go wrong despite the best of intentions. And one of the things I really struggle with myself is we're gonna get it wrong. Nothing is perfect. We are going to make mistakes, but how do we know when our efforts are flawed, but still moving us forward are, or are in fact doing as much damage as they are doing good that are actually just reifying the power structures that we seek to dismantle. 
So thank you. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, we're going to move to uh, our last uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Matthew Volgraf, who is a cultural historian of science focusing on modern Central Europe and currently Nomis Fellow at the University of Basel. Matthew is co-editor with Frank Fehrenbach of Ecologies of Expression, uh, which was published last year. Uh, Matthew, please speak now. You have about six to eight minutes. Thank you, uh, Nilan Jan. And um, yeah, thank you to, to all of you and um, especially to Monica for this, this, this book and this opportunity. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm anything but a, a specialist in um, South Asian art. Um, I'm a Germanist and that in itself that I'm here is a testament to the breadth and the the range and depth of this book, um, and which I've I've learned a great deal from and taken no shortage of inspiration from its methodological reflections. Um, nowhere more so than in my current research, which examines the, uh, the political uses of narratives of cultural contact, influence, and migration in the deep past. Um, in the 20th century, um, that is between the world wars, where they were used in the service of anti-colonial nationalism, as well as imperial expansion. And these diffusionist models, to which uh, Monica Juneja uh, pointed earlier, uh, laid the foundations, one could argue, for a certain form of global art history with their emphasis on circulation, exchange, and usage of objects as historical sources. But in spite of that emphasis on reciprocal influence and connectivity, diffusionism generally presupposed the essential purity of individual cultures, even as they tracked their interactions and mutual influences over time and space. This is a methodological issue that remains no less prevalent in contemporary disciplines. Um, you know, in the, the wake of the you know, global turn. Um, uh, and Junaida's book, Can Art History Be Made Global, offers a generative path out of this impasse. Um, nothing less than an alternative, I hesitate to use that word now, uh, ontology of culture that is at once a research program for a genuinely global art history. So as, you know, following on what Deborah said so eloquently, the conception of transculturation goes beyond the binaries of global universalism and national or local particularism uh, by radically questioning the in inherited essentialisms so deeply entrenched in the field, its categories, its institutions. Um, and I think it does this thanks not least to the consistent and, and uh, penetrating attention that it devotes to the shifting power dynamics um, at play and how these generate new relations, how they bridge the epistemic foundations of the field with larger processes of nation building um, and identity construction, and not to mention with the economic pressures of the global art market in the present. And that comes through very vividly in the fifth chapter's discussion of the exhibition, Le Magicien de la Terre. Um, it, I, I also, just want to echo uh, the speakers before me in in praising the way the the book layers its analysis through a co coordinated range of of in depth case studies that interrogate the the interaction of the global and national at multiple scales, really operationalizing that concept of scale that um, that is taken up in in the second chapter whether that's individual artists and their trajectories, an international exhibition, or truly global categories, as you show, like modernism or the, the double-edged concept of primitivism. Um, so this perspective, this, these meditations from the periphery, as the book subtitle put it, puts it, um, prove especially perspicacious uh, for me when applied to Germany, uh, my own my own field of um, of, of study uh, in the first chapter, the world in a grain of sand. I was really gratified by the the nuanced criticism that um, that that you give of of uh, world art studies, this macro historical approach to universally valid, um, based on universally valid criteria, 
that is that are perilously close to evolutionary and, and neurological um, uh, projects. And as as you noted in the introduction earlier, many advocates of world art studies cite nineteenth century German um, art history, Weltkunstgeschichte, world art history, as its precursor, as if these were somehow united over a century by uh, the spirit of liberal cosmopolitanism and the, the, the sheer virtue of diversity and ecumenical scope. And so your, this book is one of the first accounts I've read that really takes this fairly, by now, fairly widespread uh, account, uh, narrative to task. Um, showing how world art history uh, in, in the period of the formation of the discipline in Germany promised privileged access into the psychologies of non-Western populations, their Volksgeist, and, and integrated them into linear surveys um, as anonymized and hierarchized collectivities, and how these, these tendencies bear an uncanny resemblance to institutional structures um, still, still active today. And so, um, you know, the the you address the Viennese art historian Josef Strogowski, and I have some a couple of questions that I'll um, that will that will follow off on this, where again this this paradox is is um, is really vivid, visibly at work. His his noted nationalism and Aryan fanaticism. Um, somehow undergirded the most robust program for non-European art studies of its time. And he actually did an enormous amount to promote the expansion of the discipline from Eastern Europe to Central Asia, the Caucasus, South Asia, and even East Asia. But the expanded geography isn't enough. And that's the lesson for the present, I think, since simply diversifying the canon uh, doesn't, doesn't fundamentally alter the frameworks in which they, they sit. Um, and if this book has con convinced me of anything, it's that the, the fabric of a truly global art history must work at the seams where the transculturation occurs, that perhaps this fabric itself is nothing but those seams. Um, it means that art history must become as well, as was already indicated, um, a more collaborative endeavor not only across regions, but also across disciplines, working together with archaeology um, and anthropology. So, my my question, my first question is is really um, more specific to Strogovsky, whose whose work um, you know really inspired and gave ammunition to nationalist art histories in Armenia, Croatia, Romania, Turkey, and so on. And as you write on page 171, nationalist art history was as much a product of transculturation with approaches and methods of the discipline formed elsewhere, which had unfolded through a history of contact. So I wonder what would it look like to apply this perspective of the, on the history of art to, the, the, to art historiography itself? Um, and Susanna Leib has, has pointed out, Strzegowski himself grew up in Galicia on the Polish border of the Habsburg Empire as the son of uh, textile manufacturers who produced fabric, we're back to fabrics, uh, for the Ottoman Empire, among others. And, and this, is, this is already um, enormously suggestive. Um, and we, we could also point to another, um, another case that you, you take up with, with um, with great, great verve in the third chapter, the historian of Indian art, Stella Kramrisch, um, who was born in Vienna and trained herself at Strugovsky's Institute, uh, went on to a career that um, traversed Calcutta, uh, London, and Philadelphia. And she introduced you know, Indian folk art, among other things, to the Cold War United States. And, and her pursuit of the Indianness of Indian art was a combination built on a combination of Germanic formalism, formalist art history, theosophy, Hindu spirituality, Sanskrit scholarship, as, as Parul Dabi Mukherjee has also written about quite beautifully. It's with reference to this search for a distinctive Indianness that you, you propose that Kramersh might have given a blueprint for nationalist art history in the years following 
India's emergence as an independent nation state, not least by contributing to the erasure of its Muslim past. But what would it mean to think about this, um, such a, an ultimately an art history that, though essentialist in some of its tenets, is nevertheless a, a product of transculturation? How can we how can we take that? Um, how can we use that to deconstruct uh, the field's own history? And my my second and final question also just um, reverberates with others um, that have been that have been given before, um, which is the concerning the the, the conclusion, the afterward, um, in which you you address the challenge of of climate change and um, and reformulating globality in terms of a planetary and non-anthropocentric um, uh, approach. And I really loved the the, the in-depth reading of Abul Hassan's painting um, as well, the paintings, the squirrels in a plane tree. Um, and you show that it, this can be achieved through, among other things, the attention, attentiveness to the di dynamic and processual nature of the works making, as well as its material um, constitution as well as I love the, the sheep um, example too that Deborah um, alluded to but you yourself asks ask these questions and I just want to throw them back to you to what extent does the nature culture division still structure ideas of transculturation and what would let me put it this way would transculturation still be the appropriate name for a more than human, art history. So I'll stop here and uh, conclude again with my warmest congratulations on this extraordinary achievement. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, I'm going to invite Monica to respond briefly now to, to some of the questions and issues that have been raised or comments or anything she may want to say. But just before that, I wanted to repeat for members of the audience that if you'd like to ask any questions, I can see one in front of me, but if um, you want to ask more questions, then uh, please do type them in the chat box and we will post them later on as we proceed with the discussion. Monica, uh, would you like to take a few minutes and just quickly respond to at least some of the questions and then I'll invite Paru. Yeah, briefly is something of a challenge because I've got three pages of notes that I've made. But first of all, I want to really sincerely thank all the commentators for this very deep engagement with the book and with your very, very thoughtful comments. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, praise coming from such an eminent panel <laughs> is uh, means a lot. Um, thank you also for all the questions. Let, let me see how I can you know, bring some order into how, you know, the the, the larger question that um, <clears throat> Deborah asks about, and I think it ties up also with something which Matthew said, you know, how, how, the, how do we move forward if the discipline absorbs uh, <clears throat> everything, uh, even if we are, you know, trying in our own areas to kind of open it up to new kinds of questions, you know, constantly questioning the frameworks. Um, you know, a really ambitious answer for that. And that's something we come up with again. I think we just have, which also means, you know, sort of institutional change. Uh, we have to kind of just change our way of working. I, you know, it's um, so much, I think it's so much more productive if um, one worked collaboratively because you need, you need different linguistic uh, competences to do a work uh, like this. You need um, this, Disciplinary, Matthew mentioned, you know, archaeology and depending on what you're working on, you need different kinds of disciplinary competences. And because it also means, you know, kind of breaking out of the canon. I love this um, example of the textiles. And of course, Sylvia Hertling has written this wonderful book. But I think one of the reasons that I, and I sort of apply that to myself also the, in the book is that we are trained in a particular way as art historians. And in that training, you know, we, we take the same, uh, the, so, so architecture, painting, sculpture, I mean, those are the kind of media, uh, the, the canon. And actually, if you, you know, if you break out, not just sort of keep adding, okay, now people are also, there's a, there's a lot of work that's going on about on textiles also, but it's not just a question of enlarging the canon, the canon is being enlarged, but what does that enlargement mean, you know, to, to transform the kind of values the discipline carries with itself, it, it, it transports. So 
it's, you know, it's sort of change in different directions, which also means institutional change. You know, our teaching syllabi have to change the way, you know, <clears throat> doctoral programs maybe also need to have to change. Why can't two people write a doctoral thesis in this, uh, together? <laughs> of course, I mean, no university administration. I mean, they sort of throw their hands up in despair if you suggest something like that. I think that could be something quite productive, you know. And this, this kind of transcultural history, uh, <clears throat> you know, needs those, uh, needs a particular um, kind of competence, which, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, you know, have to be just one person. So, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an, it's an uphill task. And the other thing is that, you know, I think what's happening is that this, we, I encounter when we're teaching, um, that there are, um, um, there are lots of very interesting, excellent bits of research done all over in little pockets. Hmm? And they remain isolated in those pockets. You have to kind of break out the isolation and make them talk to each other. So there's a lot of groundwork it, it requires. Uh, the question that you asked, Deborah, about taking the project back in time, uh, absolutely. You know, I, I didn't do it because I didn't feel competent enough because if I'd worked with an archaeologist, I could have, uh, because we we have archaeologists also in, in Heidelberg who've been working like that throughout. You can do histories of, I have a, my colleague in Buddhist studies at, at my institute does, you know, does Buddhism, you know, in an, in, which is an extremely, histories of religion can be done, um, you know, transculturally. So I think, again, uh, it certainly is possible. It needs to be done. And, 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 it's uh, you know you, again you need you need the kind of disciplinary competence to be able to do it. Um, <clears throat> the um, yeah the the question of the medium yeah I love the example of the sheep and Annie brought up this thing of the architecture and 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 especially this it's the biennial you know which allows you to make to bring these things together and talk I mean I I ha I don't have any. Um, in issues about that at all. Um, I, I think, you know, all, all these institutions, it's not, you know, it's sort of black and white. It's, you know, it's just trying to see how they, they, they function. But I think they can also, the, the works themselves also has, may have a power to break out of the kind of sort of market driven frameworks, if you like, uh, that, that, you know, that shape or big capital that shapes these institutions. And in well, architecture is is really an area which I I worked on uh, for uh, many years before I wrote this book, and I um, and it's and it, there's there's much that it it offers to a study like this. There's no doubt about that. Um, I find it very difficult now. This is a personal um, observation, really, to come back to the subject uh, when I see what's happening in the city of New Delhi today under the in the name of decolonization. <laughs> it's um, it. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, <clears throat> so you know the, the places you work on you know spent yeah uh, uh, the, the buildings that you worked on um, for years uh, it's uh, yeah it's a difficult situation and that actually brings me to this whole question of the nation state uh, because it's come up in many of these comments it's also i think ties up with both the the observation on Kramrish and um <clears throat> and, and Strigovsky. and this i think runs through the whole book you know the nation and the nation state i mean i think we need to conceptually distinguish between the two but it's also something which which has many faces and that's here this is where historical situatedness plays an important role so the if we think of you know nation building in in, in the European context in the late from the late 18th through the 19th centuries, um, it had a you know a particular quality, and we see that in the first chapter that I wrote. So it can produce, you know, it can produce a kind of a liberal framework. I mean, the nations were historically <clears throat> concomitant with the emergence of uh, democracy, and yet from the very start that democracy was caught in, in contradictions, who had the rights and who had not. <laughs> and, and, and through this art, the writing of art history, you know, this wanting to kind of op open it up, this, um, this shine cosmopolitanism, as you can say, is, is also caught. And that's why 
in the in the authors that I um, um I discuss in the first chapter, you can see they all exemplify different qualities that a sense of being a nation brings into the discipline. So they might have you know a more liberal um, a kind of a, a, a diverse though underlying is the same master narrative, or you can or it, it has a quality which in the in the case of Shugovsky can go. In, in the other direction, which is really, you know, fascism. And I think there we need to ask the question as to, you know, what is the, um, you know, Strzegovsky, I can, I mean, I can talk a lot about because he's, he's now being revived again. He was untouchable for a long time. <laughs> and now he's been revived again. And, and especially because his work has inspired these, it's interesting, it's inspired nationalist artistries in East Europe. Uh, whereas his, his own work seemed to move beyond national frames covering. But, you know, if you see how he works and how he actually assess what is the way he analyzes the implications of the processes he claims to be studying i think you i think the contradictions uh, come out there and in the end it's really the um <clears throat> it's this very paradoxical quality of nationalism that uh, that brings these different and you see this um you see this also where in later phases of nationalism in post-colonial nationalism. And I think one of the questions was about, uh, which also deals with, you know, modernism. Yeah, and Cranbridge, that's right. So um, <clears throat> uh, there were a lot of modernist art, and this is not any, you know, done, it's done this wonderful work in Africa. Modernist art was in many, in all, in many post-colonial contexts was driven by national feeling because nationalism was a kind of emancipation emancipative force, you know, um, uh, and uh, because it was anti-colonial. And I think you have to see in particular historical moments what it means. And, and in the same post-colonial nations today, you know, uh, use nationalism in, in almost neo-fascist ways. So I think it's the, it's the process of nation building itself. How is nationalist form, the internal processes, you know, the, the drive towards homogenization, the drive towards the search for uniqueness, the the uh, you know the the contained borders of the nations. I think it's these this the, um, processes that make these contradictory meanings uh, um, possible. Cramrish, you know, comes from um, from Europe. She she's trained in these formalist methods of art. She comes to an Indian context where the discourse of about Indian art history in a colonial context was, I mean, the you know, the colonial powers were like the gatekeep were gatekeepers. So Indian art didn't even qualify as art. They were used, so it was either antiquarianism, they were called antiquities, or it was sort of anthropologizing the other in the world art history mode. So when Cranrish comes with a formalist approach to art, it's a way of dignifying <laughs> that particular art history and taking it out of the field of antiquarianism or uh, de delinking it from anthropology. And I think that's, and she, <clears throat> and that mode of dignifying was something which was then picked, is been picked up by nationalist art history, I think. So when I say it is transcultural, so because it's, it trans, it carries these currents from across the globe and within an Indian context, then you know, so the, so the nationalist artistry in an Indian context is not something that's uh, that's produced purely from within, but it's kind of tied up with with all these currents which go back to Strzegovsky's Vienna, and so that was the kind of um, argument I was um, <laughs> making. Um, yeah, maybe I can stop here. Let's give Parul a chance to talk, <laughs> and then if, sure. if there's time, I can come back. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm mm -hmm. sorry I had to ask you to rush, but... No, uh, no, it's okay. Uh, 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 maybe at the end, I will come back to Deborah's question about doing damage and doing good. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sure. But uh, let's... let's. Uh, I, I want to hear Parul's voice now. <laughs> sure, great. Um, Parul Davi Mukherjee has very kindly agreed to be discussant. Uh, so we, we've uh, agreed that, that Parul will make her own comments about the book and then begin begin the discussion. Uh, Parul Dave Mukherjee is professor in the School of Arts and Aesthetics at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi and editor of Ibrahim Al-Kazi, Directing Art, The Making of a Modern Indian Art World. Parul, please speak down. Thank you, Nilanjan. And uh, let me join everyone in congratulating 
Monica on this book, which has made such an enormous contribution to the field of art history, and especially is focused on South Asia. And I think the book also encapsulates insights from decades of your own research, Monica, mm -hmm. and it offers a very powerful critique of Eurocentric art history. And like others, I also admit that it is a heavy book and <laughs> I took my own time following your very rich theoretical arguments. And, you know, the, all the three speakers have admirably brought out some key concerns of the book and they've come to it from very interesting different directions. Annie highlighted the frame of climate change, uh, architecture, coevalness, and Deborah on the overwhelming power of the very discipline of art history to even absorb the critique and move on with greater force. And Matthew uh, highlighted the fraught complicity between the nationalist art histories and, uh, and the very framework of transculturalism. And I think you have persuasively responded to the queries. Um, before I begin, I must also inform the audience that at JNU School of Arts and Aesthetics, a few months ago, we had a riveting discussion around this book. And um, we were joined by uh, another scholar, Sandeep Lewis, who also offered thought-provoking response to the book. So, so during that time, I had focused primarily on the introduction and the four chapters and the, some of the key theoretical concerns uh, which Monica, you had engaged with. And uh, I must admit that it is during the second reading that I was able to uh, pay much you know, close attention to the postscript, uh, which I had earlier skimmed through. So some of my comments will also spring from uh, this concluding section of the book, which I found extremely rewarding uh, and provocative at the same time. So I'm going to put forward four broad responses to the book. And the fifth one is really, uh, you know, directly concerning uh, the postscript. So although as the title of this book says, can art history be made global? And I think in the book throughout, Monica, you uh, keep acknowledging that transculturalism is kind of the main scaffolding of the book. So while I understand that in your chapter three, which is about transcultural modernism, the focal point is South Asia. And this focus is, I think, totally understandable as you argue against a diffusionist, multiple alternative regional modernisms. However, it's in the next chapter, that is chapter four, which is on contemporary art practice, that you once again bring South Asia into the focal point. And here I see South Asia more or less a euphemism for India, because most of the artists that you discuss are from this part of the world. Since one of the aims of this chapter is to explore forms of identity beyond the nation, I was wondering if this focal point on South Asia, particularly when the chapter is on contemporary art practice, uh, do you find that a productive, you know, uh, kind of a uh, focus, or do you think it at times it kind of you know gets it uh, forces you to you know be more restrictive? So that's kind of my query to you. The second um, observation that I had is regarding your critique of the global contemporary, uh, you know, term, as you mentioned, coined by Hans Welting and Andrea Gudenzeig. I think it, you have really articulated your own critical take on it. You refer to this massive first of its kind exhibition, I think which took place in Karlsruhe. Um, it was called Global Contemporary, Art Worlds after 1989 in 2012. Many artists from the Global South were invited to be part of this exhibition and I think you have problematized this exhibition in interesting ways uh, about how the very terms of legibility of contemporary art from outside the West was laid by the curators on their own terms. And you also call out, you know, it's underlying neoliberal ideology. You question it and you say that today it's more important to counter the logic of neoliberal capital and the neo national cultural politics, which I find it very relevant in the wake of what's happening in my city, New Delhi. And we did discuss about it when you were here last, you know, in the context of G20. And uh, so in this very fraught context, uh, 
I find your reference to this very intriguing term, cosmopolitics of resistance, uh, very productive. I also understand your reservation about the term decolonization, which was brought up some time back, and rightly so, because you know this term has lately been used and abused, you know, left, right, and center. In India, currently, there's a compelling critique of decolonization by, and it's coming from very interesting quarters. Uh, those who have taken initiatives are artists who call themselves Dalit or Ambedkarite. Um, and so what they do is instead of rejecting decolonization, they want to expand its remit to go beyond European colonization and also include the internal colonization, which they think has kept alive even something like caste system for, you know, which is surviving down to our own times. And they make a strategic equation between caste and race, which goes beyond the national boundaries and also allows solidarity across nations along say common experience of social and political discrimination. So for example, an artist from the Dalit Ambedkarite you know, group would have something in common with an artist from South Africa. So would you read this possibility of you know, alliance as a kind of cosmopolitics of resistance? So that was uh, one of my questions. And my third point is, again, I return to transculturalism as an abiding framework in your book and in your introduction, you justify its usefulness in many ways. And the most interesting for me is how you address the question of epistemic violence, saying that transculturalism helps explain the transformation of the theory, which may have had its prominence in Europe, but it never remains the same when it migrates to another cultural context. So within this transcultural landscape of flow of ideas and theories, is there scope to explore the possibility of non-Western art theory? Because non-West is not some black slate that just registers these transformations of ideas which are coming from elsewhere. And I know that as far as this area is concerned, we have a lot of commonalities of interest. Uh, fourth, um, I'm also curious to understand your reluctance to do away with nationalism, which fully acknowledges you know, uh, the complicities between the national and the global. In fact, you did uh, mention the, the, your ex perhaps it was your experience of being in Delhi last, that, that there's a kind of a crisis going on within the cultural sphere, politics of culture. And in the current uh, cultural politics, nationalism is quick to claim itself as global, which is very different from the national of the national modern, you know, about which Ita Kapoor, for example, has really, uh, you know, theorized in very interesting ways. Because earlier, uh, under the ages of the national modern, it posited itself in opposition to the threats coming from internationalism. But what we witness today is very disturbing complicity between the national and the global, which is almost unfolding, um, you know, every other day here, where claims of nationalist self-reliance and, and the catchphrase which is used uh, today is Atmanir Bhatka, which is a Sanskrit term for self-reliance, is justified in the name of going global. Or another status claim, which goes with it is, you know, uh, one belongs to the world, which is nothing other than one family. You know, I'm sure everybody, everybody must have heard about it. It's really become one of the statist mantras. So global has become a catchphrase for cultural nationalists to justify their own variety of ethno-nationalism. And uh, finally, let me turn to your postscript and you're alluding to this very, very captivating uh, uh, 17th century Mughal painting, The Hunter and the Squirrel, um, as a way of meditating on the possible future course of art history uh, that would seem to turn the entire European Enlightenment legacy on its head. And uh, your argument against a radical separation of epistemology from ontology, I think you're uh, drawing from Karen Barat, 
and you're turning to South Asia as a domain to explore trans-species relationships. Uh, I, I think you also underline the materiality of making, which I think it's a very interesting uh, reading, understanding of materiality, which acts as a bridge um, between the maker, the work, and the world. Such a way of conceptualizing points to a reading of art as something organic, and let me quote you here, a process of becoming in which the human artist is one of many actors, a co-producer, who conjoins his energies to work on active materials, unquote. So in a sense, I do understand that this approach is pointing towards a new direction in art history, but at the same time, I cannot help being reminded of Stella Cranbridge and a term that she uses, a transubstantiation, through which she saw the creativity of nature to find expression through the artistic production. Maybe she too wanted to contest the Eurocentric model of an artist who is supposed to have this full autonomy, you know, realized by pitting himself against nature. Cranbridge too talks about this co-creativity where it is nature which is creating through the artist. While it is refreshing here to talk about the idea of co-production that questions the dominance of uh, dominance enjoyed by the artist, I'm slightly um, uncomfortable about how this model serves to eclipse the creative expression of a traditional artist, which is an intentional you know, act of creation, right? Where Traditional artist is not some you know, passive conduit or channel for nature to just create through. And it is here that nat native art theory may offer some insights into non-Eurocentric ideas of creativity. At the same time, I'm aware that these, uh, these uh, theories of creativity are not less mired in politics of representation, especially in the Indian context. Uh, uh, by which I mean, you know, the whole, uh, the caste dynamics. And it is this arena which would fall outside the purview of the planetary and the Anthropocene uh, frameworks. And finally, turning to your very compelling visual example of the hunter and the squirrel. So while it's a very compelling example to talk about an exquisite multi-species cohabitation in an idyllic world, brilliantly painted by this Mughal artist, how does one account for not so hidden violent intent of the hunter who is climbing the tree to catch the squirrels? Or is it just an intent cloaked under the cover of picture, uh, picturesque aesthetization? So does the Anthropocene framework that you invoke work as a double-edged instrument while it opens up a new future for global art history that turns the human as one of the many players in a multi-species universe and helps us to recover the lost ontologies, uh, you know, term which comes from your usage, but it also robs us of the political, which may get lost in this long temporality. So with this, I'm going to conclude my, uh, my discussion, my uh, observation about your book, and I look forward to your response, Monica. Thank you, uh, Parul. I'm very conscious of time, and we have a couple of questions. Parul, there is one for you as well. Uh, but, uh, Monica, would you like to respond to not just what Parul said, but some of the other things that you wanted to ask? Well, yeah, uh, no, I'll be very brief, though, but because I think when, while Parul was speaking, and especially about this nature-culture difference, I remembered another point that came up in the earlier discussion, maybe Matthew made it about how transculturation uh, and, uh, you know, can that also hmm, transcend this divide between the nature? Okay, first let me say the postscript hmm, is really a kind of looking forward. It poses more questions than it gives answers. But these questions, I think they follow logically from the kind of long investigation I did about the potentiality of you know, a new ontology of culture that the transcultural makes available. So if you think with that new ontology, then I think you can, you, you automatically come to the point where you confront 
um, all these discussions about climate change and the Anthropocene and this overcoming of um, enlightenment ontologies and to ask that can this notion of culture, which till now has been, you know, <clears throat> made more capacious to um, um, to see itself constituted through inter interactions between other cultural units, can this also uh, accommodate um, a relationship between the human and the non-human? That was a question I asked, and I tried to provide certain pointers in which direction it could go. Um, and here I need to make one point very clear, which I didn't make it in, well, I didn't make it really explicit in the book. I think it's come out also of discussions, classroom discussions, I think, that I'm not advocating a post-humanist uh, approach where I think that every material object, ev you know, every non-human has agency. I don't use the word actant, which Bruno Latour has used to give that the uh, approach, because I think, you know, um, the, ter the concept of agency involves cognition and inter involves intentionality. And I think there you need to draw a border. And yet, having said that, when you look at a work of art, whatever it is, whether it's a building or it's a uh, <clears throat> it's a manuscript page, uh, the the role of the material and the materiality has to be brought back. I mean, I'm I'm working also against a dematerialization of um, um, of art, and that's when the um, uh, uh, the the other sort of non you know where is where is paper come from where it's the the, the 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 brushes the artists use so it's that's where and and I'm, I'm recapturing some of the um the cosmologies of the artists who who made that so I think that distinction needs to be made the return of the political I think is very important and here again and that's why um this is an argument that art history has to intervene in this discussion where the notion of the Anthropocene things is you know coined not just by geologists and others but or who work on these large scales but also certain historians i know dipesh chakravarti has been kind of alternative between different positions where you talk about an entire humanity that is um, affected by climate change so it, it breaks out of distinctions and yet we all know very well that there are certain sections of humanity who are complicit you know and and and, and derive from the benefits of what is happening that is producing climate change. So I think the political, you know, comes is, is not, and, and, I, and I think the humanities have to come back into this because only the humanities can problematize the issue of the political. I think this, we can't leave this to geologists and natural scientists and paleo, uh, <coughs> paleontobiologists and so on. So that's, I think that's an important thing. I haven't, as I said, this is just a postscript. It's looking forward and, and, and I don't have all, the, the answers. Um, let me come back to this one more uh, question that you raised, because that's a very fundamental question about decolonization. And I stand by my position that I don't like the word decolonization because it's used too loosely. It can it's used for anything and everything, and and I think it's it's like the global, you know, it's uh, it, it's become a vacuous kind of signifier. Any any you know any kind of critical position, so you decolonize the museum, you decolonize syllabi, you decolonize the city. I mean, what 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 does it tell you? What does it mean? Um, I and I don't want to use a term like this to talk about alliances, which are which are very vital. I think today we need, um, I mean, if we just look at what's happening in the world around us today, you need alliances that, that cut across national uh, <clears throat> borders. Um, and this is what the cosmopolitics of resistance, this is something somebody else I quoted, you know, I mean, it's not my term, it's, it's in quotes in the, in the book, but I think it's a useful term to to use so um and 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 alliances are not just strategic solidarity you know needs something more fundamental to be built on and they have to be built so um and i don't think decolonization is a good word for that because it um it, it, and the fact that it it's you know it's so loose um it, that it uh, it 
its misuse. I mean, we see its misuse in the Indian context. You see China misusing decolonization to talk about Hong Kong. So it can, you know, it lends itself to misuse. And this links up this thing about non-Western art theory. I think the thing about transculturation, it, it doesn't think, uh, it, it, it cautions you against thinking in terms of the West and the non-West, but to look at actually art theory that is, uh, uh, that is also historically situated and is formed through processes of, um, <clears throat> of, of, of interaction. So, um, I, I mean, I could sort of go on uh, for a longer time on many of the points that you you made, but um, <clears throat> so it, and yes, the nation, you know, the uh, um, then the nation itself. I think because because it has many many different lineaments, and I think we need to define those lineaments instead of discarding the context. Because today it's taken on a neo-fascist form. I think that neo-fascist form. Um, was always there in the present. We see it in the 19th century. We see it in its most brutal form in the middle of the 20th century. So it's always built into this. And I think um, to um, we need to be aware of what this concept hmm, carries with it, what its baggage it's carrying with it, to be able to uh, to, to understand its its different possibilities. So I don't want to throw it out simply because it's been used, but I think we need to, to, to be able to that understand why, you know, is something that in a particular point of time had a different dimension, you know, it, it taken on this very uh, threatening phase today. Maybe I can stop there, Nilanjan, since it's already 5.30 and you, you have questions. Okay, uh, thank you. Yes, I'm conscious of time and it's 4.30 where we are. Uh, and it's different times in different places for people. But uh, there are a couple of questions, Monica. One is for you. I'm just going to read it because I am i don't want to paraphrase. Um, and this is about transcultural theory, mm -hmm. the, the, the phrase transcultural theory. Uh, having encountered transcultural theory before, especially in studies of the early Indian Ocean and the Red Sea, what are the author's precedents or intellectual genealogies for the use of this term? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's an important question, and I have discussed it um, in the book. I, in fact, I use the term a theory of transculturation. Hmm? I use the transcultural as an adjective to describe processes, and the process is transculturation. And, and I knew the theory. I know it's been used in many different ways, and um, I define actually what this theory is. Hmm? In, entails because a theory involves uh, a set of methods. It involves a certain kind of toolbox and concepts and what it builds on. I think my entire introduction is about that. In my own field, I know that it was used by Finbar Barry Flood in his uh, in his book. He he used the term transculturation and he also went back to uh, Ortiz and he used it to describe a certain phenomenon. Which and I think it was a very important book. He, um, I think the difference between his approach and mine is that for him it was one amongst many different theories because his book, you know, is 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 very theoretically laden, where he draws from um, a lot of um, and, and different, you know, post-colonial theory, and uh, he also because he deals with materials, so he also uh, um, uh, draws on radical materialism. And, and this this is kind of this is one particular aspect and it's linked to this whole question of Hindu and Muslim identity in pre-modern India. Um, I think I um, I make that actually the central scaffolding and I break it down to see uh, what are the, what are the possible tools. So that's the way. I think it's been used in a number of ways, especially Indian Ocean studies, to talk about anything involving two cultures, you know, as a synonym for cross-cultural. And for me, the transcultural is much more than the cross-cultural. It's a kind of epistemic critique of disciplines. I think that's the difference. Okay, thank you. Uh, Parul, there is a question for you. Uh, you used the, the words non-Western art historical theory. Uh, could Parul Dave Mukherjee please clarify what she means by non-Western art historical theory? Does she mean art historical theory in non-Western languages? Don't they produce nationalist frictions? Briefly. Well, this refers to my own research on one of the early Indic texts, uh, uh, which is called the Chitta Sutra, 
And it's also, incidentally, the text which was uh, translated for the first time by Stella Cramrish. Uh, so because of her translation, it really entered into the domain of art history. And uh, so I, in fact, my PhD was uh, to bring out critical edition of the text. And that that is when I really began to uh, understand that there was such a vibrant uh, theory of art, uh, theory of artistic representation, visuality of representation. And there was this um, indigenous or native term for mimesis, which I, uh, which in Sanskrit is called anukriti, which posed a, a problem in translation for me because it's very difficult to find exact mm -hmm. one, one translation. So it really opened up a whole new field of thinking for me in terms of comparative aesthetics. It's very much part of my core area of research. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I and mean, we don't have more questions. We are also on borrowed time, but I am going to ask each of you, starting with you, Annie, uh, anything else briefly you'd like to say? Um, I think it's a bit difficult, you know, to to start asking questions now if we're closing down. I mean, there are actually quite a lot of things that have come up subsequently in the discussions that we've just had and the, the uh, issues that have been raised by uh, speakers subsequently, because of course I, I was the first one um, talking. But I, I, I think it's probably better just to leave it because it's just gonna open up too much at this point. You know, if we're shutting it down, I think it's not helpful. Sure. I mean, you can go ahead and say it, and even if briefly, but I, I mean, I don't, obviously don't want to force you if you don't want to do it. No, I think I'll leave it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, did you want to say anything? Um, just that uh, I wish we had another two hours. I we could continue this. I have so many things that I could discuss and ask everyone. It's been really a wonderful discussion. And I just, I think it's such a tricky, but pressing topic that really does need so much of our time and attention. Um, so thank you all very much. That I guess that, that's my concluding remark. So thanks. Uh, Matthew. I will also just um, conclude with my my thanks and, uh, and hope that this discussion leads to um, ongoing conversation um, amongst us all and especially looking forward to Monica's next book. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we, I think we can we can then end here. Uh, I do want to thank everyone, including uh, everyone in the audience who's been watching uh, all through. Uh, we've gone slightly over time, so apologies if we've caused delays to, to anyone. I do also say um, at the end of I mean, you know, we, we do uh, events almost every week of teaching term. And I do say at the end of almost each one of them that if there's anything good that has come out of the pandemic, it is just that we have become better at handling technology and that uh, we are now able to have these kinds of conversations, uh, so very interesting conversations that are literally global in terms both of the speakers and participants, as well as uh, the audience. Uh, at the same time, I do also say, which I sincerely mean, that as as curators and as organizers of this event, you know, we cannot put these together unless we have people like you, all of you, who give so generously and so freely of your time and your expertise, because it is not just about making comments, it's about having read this book and thought about it and reflected on it. Uh, so our individual uh, thanks to each of you and to all of you collectively for making this such a uh, wonderful discussion uh, this afternoon. I've no doubt everyone who's been hearing it has benefited a lot uh, from it. Uh, Monica Juneja, uh, Annie Coombs, Deborah Hutton, Matthew Fulgraf, and Parul Dave Mukherjee. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.